Good afternoon. Welcome to the Committee on Fiscal Affairs. Um, first item of business is the approval of the minutes from the meeting we had on September 7th. Move it. Any questions? Second. Second. Any questions, comments, changes? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Second item of business is consideration of the fiscal year 2012-2013 operating uh, budget for the university, mm -hmm. or the request at least. Okay. Right? And Matt, will you be going to the PowerPoint presentation? Yeah. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Thanks, Chair Loda. Um, in front of all of you is a PowerPoint presentation that I'm going to go through. Um, as part of your um, electronic documents, the actual budget request is included in there that provides much more detail than I'm going to go through. Um, but for this meeting, we'll, we'll go through the budget request um, PowerPoint presentation. So let's start on slide two. And again, just as we've been in for the last several years, the state and city are both facing challenging fiscal years for fiscal year 13. Um, the state's budget deficit for next year is projected to be $2.4 billion. Um, and the state, through the actions it took in the enacted budget, last spring um, significantly brought down their deficit for, for fiscal 13. It was well above $10 million last year. Um, and so now it's 2.4. Um, so still a challenge, but, but not nearly as big as the number they had last year. Um, the city has a much bigger projected deficit at this point of $4.6 billion. Uh, I'm sure most of you have read that the, the mayor recently asked all city agencies for additional round of reductions to try to close that gap for next year. So again, the state and city are both looking at um, you know, having to close significant gaps for, for next year. And I'm sure, again, most of you know the history um, here at CUNY over the last four fiscal years, since fiscal year 2009. We have sustained significant reductions um, at our senior colleges. We had a $95.1 million reduction in the current fiscal year, fiscal year 12, which brought our four-year total up to $300 million. And our community colleges haven't been spared either um, from the reductions. The community college base aid that we receive from the state, the rate has been reduced by 20% uh, over the last four fiscal years. And while that's happened, our enrollment at the community colleges has gone up by 26%. So we have had challenges at both our senior colleges and our community colleges, and our campus presidents have had to make really difficult decisions over the last few years um, and how to manage their budgets. Um, at the senior colleges for fiscal year 2011, the year that we just closed, overall spending actually went down year to year from fiscal year 10 to fiscal year 11. Um, and at the community college, the spending was just about flat from, from fiscal 10 to 11. And that includes all of the mandatory cost increases, um, contractual increases, and things like that. So um, our campuses have done a good job in trying to manage um, with reduced resources. Um, and so we are presenting our budget request, and included in there um, is a tuition increase for $300 at both the senior colleges and the community colleges for effective for fall 2012 semester. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that as we get into the presentation. OK, so on page three, for the, this is our seventh year that we are using the CUNY Compact as our financing vehicle for the budget request. And again, I know that you're all familiar with, with the Compact, um, the, the main theme of the compact is shared responsibilities amongst all of the partners of the university and creating opportunity to, to leverage those funds. Um, the compact, we are asking for the state and city to fund all of our mandatory needs and a portion of our investment plan. The, other, the remaining portion of the investment plan will be covered through self-financing components, mainly private fundraising, <coughs> restructuring and efficiencies within our own internal budget, revenues from enrollment growth, and the revenue from the proposed tuition increase. Okay, on slide four, talks a little bit more about the compact. Um, and I, I want to point out, again, on the tuition increase, the $300 increase would be a 5.8% increase over current rates at the senior colleges and 8.3% at the community colleges. 
Again, students who um, currently receive TAP won't have any um, negative effect of the tuition increase because that increase will, will be covered. Um, and the enrollment growth that we're projecting in our budget request and that we're planning on is 1%. Um, again, our enrollment, and we're at historic levels um, currently, and we've been working with our campuses to manage that enrollment. Um, and so we have a, a modest number of 1% for, for fiscal 13. Okay, on page five, um, I want to talk a little bit about the five-year tuition plan that was enacted by the state this past summer. Um, in this past June, the, the governor and the legislature agreed on a uh, rational tuition policy for both CUNY and SUNY, whereby both systems would be able to increase tuition up to $300 per year um, through fiscal year 2016. And the board enacted the first year of that increase this past summer when we increased tuition by $300 effective for fall 2011. Um, and as you all know, this was an, an historic um, agreement. It not only provides us with financial stability, but also enables our students and their families to plan for, the, uh, for their, what their tuition will be um, throughout their career here at CUNY and avoids those large um, unexpected spikes that we've had in the past um, at CUNY, um, whereby tuition went up by 25% one year, 32% another year. And what this will also do, um, all of these funds will be used for enhancing services at the colleges. In the past, <coughs> when the state um, would authorize tuition increases for CUNY, the entire revenue from those tuition increases all went to fill budget gaps. None of them went to uh, improve the university or to enhance the students' um, experience at, at the university. Um, and so by having um, this plan through fiscal 2016, and also, just as importantly, having the state enacting a maintenance of effort provision whereby they cannot reduce the amount of funding to our senior colleges in any one year, as we've had in the previous year, will have a, a level of stability in terms of our state aid. The last point on page five, the state legislation also requires that a tuition credit be given to students um, who are eligible for TAP. And so the TAP maximum award continues to be $5,000. With this $300 increase that we're proposing for next fall, um, at the senior colleges, our tuition will now be at $5,430. And so by state law, we are required to cover the difference and so that students who are eligible for TAP uh, won't feel any negative effect of the tuition increase. Okay, and uh, page six, just staying with the theme of financial aid, our request also proposes to set aside $5 million of the additional tuition revenue that will be generated by the increase for financial aid. And um, we really want to target it to those students who um, will have their matricula con continuing their matriculation um, be in jeopardy by the tuition increase. And we're going to do that in a few different ways. We're proposing to use that $5 million for tuition waivers and for scholarships um, to create a, a CUNY institutional work-study program modeled after the federal work-study program that we currently have on our campuses, and also to assist students with the cost of textbooks. Um, we had a student financial aid initiative back in 2010 that covered all of these components. It was very successful. Um, we, had we weren't able to continue it last year due to the, the um, budget reductions that we had from the state and the city. Um, but with the additional revenue that we're going to be generating next year, we want to um, resurrect um, this initiative. Um, students still will, will be able to, who are eligible, will still be able to receive their Pell Award of $5,550. That's another resource that our students um, have. And that last bullet point there, um, I think, provides some really illustrative figures that in, fiscal, in our last academic year, 2010-2011, almost 140,000 of our students received Pell Grants totaling 500, uh, 541 million, and over 100,000 students received TAP awards of $228 million. So 
for just from Pell and TAP alone, not including any other um, source of aid that students may have received, um, university students received um, about $770 million just from Pell and from TAP. Okay, slide seven summarizes our, um, our budget for the current year, which is a total of $2.6 billion. And you see our three main funding sources on that chart, state, city, and tuition. And so in our request for fiscal 13, we're asking for an additional $102 million for, for mandatory needs. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. And $91.9 million in programmatic needs, which would bring our total budget for fiscal 13 up to $2.8 billion. Okay, page eight talks a little bit about this investment plan, these programmatic initiatives. What will we be using this money for? Um, you saw on the previous slide that our uh, programmatic initiatives were $91.9 million from the state, city, and tuition sources. Well, we're also going to be generating um, $18 million from restructuring and efficiencies and from private fundraising. And so that would bring our total investment program to $109.9 million. And um, over the last several months, we have done consultations with our Council of Presidents Fiscal Committee um, internally here with our Office of Academic Affairs and Office of Student Services. Um, we've met with the Budget Advisory Committee, the Faculty Senate, and also with the University Student Senate to get um, their collective input on, as to what should we be investing these additional resources in. And um, overwhelmingly, the um, feedback that we got was the, most in, the, the number one thing that we should be focusing on is the addition of full-time faculty lines. And so in the request, um, as, as Part of this $110 million investment plan, $45.5 million will be set aside for the addition of 440 full-time faculty lines. Um, as you know, we've had um, an early retirement incentive, and we're down. Um, we lost about 370 full-time faculty lines through that. Um, so we want to replace those lines and add an additional 440 full-time faculty lines uh, for fiscal 13. Um, in addition, we're also asking for $2 million for our new community college, um, which is set to open this summer, um, and also $2.6 million for the expansion of the accelerated study in associates program, the ASAP initiative, which has been very successful. And that chart there on page eight um, is a terrific chart. We had this in our request last year, and we thought that it was, it was um, such a meaningful chart that we want to include it again this year. And um, you can see from that chart, the, in the, the red line there shows how m many faculty we have added since 2001. In 2001, we were around 5,500 full-time faculty, and now we're above 7,000. So our campuses have done a terrific job in adding full-time faculty. The problem is we can't keep up with the historic enrollment levels that we've had. And you can see the blue line there, the graph for the enrollment, um, is growing at a much more rapid rate than, than the faculty. And so it's very important for us to, to bring on these additional faculty lines to try to close that gap. Okay, on page nine, a little bit more about what this $110 million would be used for. $14.9 million would be for improved uh, student and academic support services, including academic advisement, student financial aid, um, services for students with disabilities, which includes our CUNY LEADS uh, program, uh, which was defunded by the state um, two years ago, and also for career services for our students. $9.7 million would be used for upgrading facilities, and facilities, um, maintenance and operation, and the upkeep of our facilities. When you go back and look at the last four years' worth of cuts since fiscal year 2009, this is the area that has been reduced the most. Um, and Understandably so in the sense that our campuses were trying to protect our core mission of instruction, but our um, maintenance and operation budgets have taken a big hit over the last four years. So we, we want to dedicate about $10 million to, to, to that area and also $10.5 million for enhancements in, in educational technology. So on slide 10, you can see the summary of our request broken out by those areas that I just covered and also broken out by the senior colleges and the community colleges. 
and as well as the mandatory cost increases of $102 million. So our total um, budget request would be $212 million. Okay, now in slide 11, I want us to spend a minute or two on the mandatory cost increases because, again, this is $102 million. Um, and the largest component of our mandatory cost increases, as it is every year, is fringe benefits. Um, fringe benefits um, for this year, we're requesting almost $73.5 million. Um, fringe benefits has been growing by a rate of about 10 to 11 percent per year over the last several years. Um, and so this year is no different. Um, included in this fringe benefit request is also um, to cover the cost of adjunct health insurance. That's included in our fringe benefits request. Um, energy costs are in there as well, as well as building rentals. Um, new buildings needs. Um, whenever we have, we're successful in securing capital funds to build a new building, we then have to set aside funding um, and request funding from the state and city for the operational costs of those buildings. And so this year, out of senior colleges, um, we're opening a new science building at Lehman College. And the School of Professional Studies is also finally getting their own space this year for just for the School of Professional Studies. So that's the operating cost for those two buildings are, are included in the $1.9 million for the senior colleges. For the community colleges, again, we have two really exciting uh, new buildings coming up. BMCC, Fitterman Hall uh, will be opening in fiscal year 13 to replace the building that was lost on 9-11. And at Bronx, the North Instructional Building uh, will be opening as well, and so that covers the $7.3 million. Last item for mandatory needs, salary increments. This represents contractual salary increments um, that our faculty and staff uh, receive, as well as OTPS inflation. So it's a total of $15 million. So slide 12 summarizes all of the funding sources of this $212 million dollars. And so um, the mandatory needs, we're asking that to be picked up um, by the state and city. Um, the programmatic initiatives, we're asking the state to pick up $11 million for the senior colleges. And this covers the um, additional 10 percent that we are um, legislatively um, due to receive from the fall 2009 tuition increase. When tuition was increased in the fall 2009, at that time, we were able to keep 20 percent of that tuition revenue for programmatic initiatives with an additional 10 percent per year until we got up to 50 percent of the total revenue in, in uh, fiscal year 13. And so um, what we're asking for the state is for that last 10 percent, um, which is $11 million. On the city side, that $4.6 million for programmatic initiative covers the expansion of the ASAP program and also the the additional funding for the new community college. The community college state base aid increase, um, this $15.6 million covers two pieces of that base aid. Um, it covers a $100 increase to the base aid amount, um, as well as the enrollment growth that we've had at our community college um, over, our, over the past year. Um, as I stated earlier, the community college base aid has taken a big reduction over the last four years. In fiscal year 2009, the base aid per full-time equivalent student was $2,675 per FTE. For this current year, it's $2,122 per FTE. So we've taken a 20 percent decrease in community college base aid from the state, and so we're asking for a $100 increase to that amount in our request for fiscal year 13. Um, as I stated earlier, we're asking, we're in assuming a 1 percent enrollment growth um, in our budget request, which would generate about $11 million. And we're also planning on $8 million in restructuring and efficiency savings within our own internal budget, as well as $10 million in additional private fundraising. And the last two slides really are to bring into context um, what this request covers and, and why it's so essential for us uh, not only to generate these resources but to invest them in, in the right areas. And that's because, as I stated earlier, we're at historic enrollment levels. Um, page 13, you can see um, our student headcount has continued to, to grow since this goes back to fiscal year uh, to 2003. But for this fall, we now had 269,000 students, which is um, the most we've ever had at this university. 
um, and that is a 29% increase from fiscal year 2003. And on slide 14, uh, this is the full-time equivalent student number, which is, again, 200 and almost 202,000 um, for this fiscal year, which is a 35% increase from 2003. And so we need to uh, be able to, again, generate the resources, not only from the state and city, but the um, internal self-financing resources from, from the compact to provide the level of students that, are that our students um, deserve. So that's our budget request. Um, I'm happy to take any questions on both the presentation or on anything that is in the document that you may have uh, questions or concerns about. Before, before we do that, I'd like to uh, put forward a motion to uh, accept this budget request and then go take questions. Sure. Uh, resolved, subject to the availability of resource, the City University seeks a total of $2.824 billion uh, for the university. This total includes additional funding of $102.5 million for baseline needs and $91.9 million for programmatic increase. It also includes an increase in tuition of $300 over the current rate uh, for full-time undergraduate students and a proportional increase in graduate, doctoral, non-resident, and per credit rates uh, for both the senior and community colleges to fund the programmatic needs. Um, I'll move this motion. Do I have a second? Second. Now we'll open up for questions. Yes, uh, on slide 11, <coughs> mandatory needs. I was trying <coughs> to track the PowerPoint with the enhanced printout. Sure. Where in the enhanced printout is there any uh, enhancement of knowledge on fringe benefit? In in the budget request document itself. Yes. Okay. If you go to the well on page. Um, on page six of the request itself, of the request document, you see that benefit number of $73.5 million broken out by senior and community. And also the tables in the back will also provide um, those numbers, page um, 25 and page 26. There's no descriptive material? No, but we can certainly uh, provide that to you in terms of what the individual costs are, whether it's, um, whether it's FICA or uh, health insurance, pension costs, we can provide that information for you. You mentioned it was a 10 percent increase. It's That's been what took for the request. Right. It's been growing about 10 to 11 percent per year for the last several years. Uh, and the three biggest components are, are the ones I mentioned, um, health insurance costs, pension costs, and also um, Social Security costs. Embedded into this is a pledge that I made and is in this document embedded into fringe benefits, and that is to deal with the problem of adjunct health insurance for a class of adjuncts that were presumably would lose their health benefits unless the welfare fund was secured, and it's not secured at this particular point. And we are in discussions now with uh, the executive uh, to see if we can get that done, but it's embedded into this, and that's where you're going to see that funded in our fringe benefits. Trustee Bale, I'm sorry, I think you had a question. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, one of the most important things that came out of the state higher ed agreement this past summer, you know, the, the um, five-year tuition plan got the most um, ink in terms of uh, coverage and what people spoke about. But one of, the, one of the just as important things that happened in that agreement was the maintenance of effort provision that was put in, um, which um, puts into law that the state cannot reduce 
um, its amount that's funded to the senior colleges in any one year as they did in the, pr in the prior year. Um, and so state aid to the senior colleges cannot go down unless in the case of a, of a fiscal emergency, um, if the state declares a fiscal emergency. Um, and so that's something that we've never had before. Um, we've had it on the city side for our community colleges, but we've never had it on the state side for our senior colleges. So that um, gives us the stability that we need um, so that we can use the tuition revenue for enhancements and, and for investment. I'm just re reading the second bullet on mm -hmm. page two. Okay. It says, as a result of the fiscal conditions of the state, CUNY has sustained $300 million in state budget reductions since 2009, including right. a 95.1 reduction in FY 2012. That sort of flies in the face of Right. Well, the maintenance of effort provision was that's put in for last year, right for for fiscal year 13. So <laughs> they can't reduce our budget to the senior colleges um, past what we have in fiscal year 12 in the current year. So that 95 million dollar reduction is for the current year, but whatever we have for this year cannot be less for next year. And on that same vein, when you say what our budget request on page 11. Mm -hmm. We are requesting that they fulfill these mandatory needs. Is that part and parcel of their their best efforts or their no, no. <laughs> their home part? So this is that the this is the one part that was not in the legislation. What is in the legislation is a five year plan, mm -hmm. uh, which is. Uh, monumental. I mean, there doesn't exist another state university in the United States today that has enacted a plan like this. So, and, and this has been, as Chairman Schmidt will tell you, this has been a battle uh, that we have waged with, uh, with Albany uh, from the time that we both came in and in the positions that we're in. So for us, this is really historic. The second piece of this is that in the past, when tuition was levied, those dollars were swept off the table. Right. In the legislation, this, this money stays uh, at the campuses or stays at the university and stays at the point of origin. That also is a very big deal. Uh, the maintenance of effort provision, that is the third leg of this particular program is also a very big deal because it gives you the security that when you baseline the year before, it's not going to go below that in, in, the, in the following year. Uh, the thing that needs to re be remembered in this plan, other than what I, I just mentioned, is that mandatory costs is a good faith effort. Uh, it is not written into the legislation, and we just, you know, we'll see. But uh, the, the, the state is determined to keep those costs uh, whole, but it's not in the legislation. The other thing that I want to emphasize about this plan, which is something that we fought very, very strenuously for, is that a part of the investment is going to be used to help students that are in harm's way. And I think that's the right thing to do. We are giving up investment income, yes, but we are also at the same time preventing students from really leaving or helping to prevent students that uh, have left the university in the past because of <coughs> tuition increases. And, and the last piece I, I would say is, and then I'll, I'll stop, is that in 1998, the university was raising approximately, uh, the numbers are a little unclear because we weren't really keeping good records of fundraising then, but someplace in the order of 40 to 50 million dollars a year, which sounds like a lot of money, but it's really a paltry sum for a university of this size and complexity. We are now uh, on target to be raising uh, probably two, two and a half maybe $230 million a year. I mean, that, I don't know of any university that's seen a quantum leap for a baseline from which we've started. And a good part of that money, a good part of that money is going to be used to help students. Mm -hmm. 
So we're all working, and that, that really is, is the intent of the compact. But now we actually have it done. I mean, we have the state finally making a commitment that they've never made before. We had an incremental move when we worked out getting 10% of the tuition, 20%, 30%, but now we get to keep it all. So I think we are going to have stability, which we have never had at this university since uh, tuition was enacted many years ago. And, and, and that's my point, Ms. Mr. Chancellor. I think that um, the administration is to be commended, but I think our goal and our responsibility is to make sure all of the stakeholders understand <coughs> what all the partners' responsibilities are in this relationship and that, you know, the more education we can do to make sure that everybody understands what all the stakeholders and partners' responsibilities are and who is engaged in this, the better off we are. So my point is to make sure that everybody understands that and that in the next legislative body and all the rounds that we go around, that all the parties hold everybody's feet to the ground and making sure that, that what is envisioned here is actually actualized. So that was what my well, point A good is. part of the pieces are well in place. Okay, very good. And, sure. and one last piece. What is our map? I know it varies from campus. Some, compa some campuses are at 101 capacity and 120. And, but in general, we can't continue to grow revenues based upon enrollment growth. Mm -hmm. What's our enrollment capacity growth, uh, capacity growth in general? Um, where do you think are we getting close to maximum enrollment? Yeah, I think at the, um, at the Manhattan campuses especially, um, they're the ones that are feeling the most stress from enrollment growth. And, and Executive Vice Chancellor Logue has done a terrific job over the last um, year and a half um, in meeting with each individual campus um, and setting their enrollment targets for, for each semester. And I think that um, has gone a long way in helping our campuses and collectively the university uh, manage its enrollment a lot better. Um, but I think the Manhattan campuses are the ones that are, that are feeling the most stress um, in terms of their enrollment and what their capacity is. So that, that's to say there's capacity in the system, but not. Yeah, I think, I think as you said uh, earlier, every campus is different. There are some campuses that have room that can grow. Um, but you know, one thing that we want to make sure that um, each campus um, is aware of when determining their enrollment growth is not only do they have the physical space, but do they have the capacity from an instructional level? Do they have the faculty? Can they provide the services to the students that right. the students is need? Um, so it's it's looking up at all of those factors: the, the space, the dollars, and and most importantly, the instructional and student services need. And my point here is to make sure that we people don't assume that we can just en enroll our way out of this <coughs> issue. That's right. That it's clear that everyone understand that there are enrollment growth limits to this as well. We, we have point. given the president very, very direct guidance on just this. Now, we've, we were a little lax in the last two years, in part because we were in a really miserable recession. A lot of people were out of work. And I thought it was a moral imperative to keep the university as open to as many people who wanted to come back to the university to shore up their skills so that they could leave in a much more competitive place in order to, to get the jobs that they needed. As we get out of the recession, and hopefully we are coming out of it much more slowly than I think any of us would like to see, uh, we're going to get and work very closely and keep uh, the campuses feet to the fire with respect to that because the thing that I worry about, not so much do we have the physical capacity because we could utilize our facilities more efficiently uh, than we do now, although I must say most of the presidents are using their campuses a good six days of the week mm -hmm. and throughout the day. But the question of dilution of the academic experience is bound to happen, especially if you cannot keep up the uh, teaching power with full-time faculty as enrollment is increasing. And you don't have the same level of um, 
due diligence in terms of how faculty are doing when you're hiring as many part-time faculty. So that's something that we really need to be deeply concerned about. Professor Martel? A series of questions. First of all, in these difficult financial times, the fact that we can include some uh, money in the uh, uh, benefits part of the budget to cover adjunct health insurance is uh, to the credit of the management team here because I think that's, uh, when we speak of moral, moral imperatives, that's certainly up there. I, I chair the PSC CUNY Welfare Fund Audit Committee, and I can tell you the money is uh, desperately, uh, desperately needed. So the right that's, thing to do. that's the right thing to do. Uh, with regard to the the tuition increase and the uh, and assuming TAP will not increase, when you put aside five million dollars, you, you're making some <coughs> assumptions about the percentage of the hundred and hundred thousand hundred eighteen students that qualify for TAP that would be at the TAP max. Have you run the projections to see where where what what our net yeah. is going to be? That that five million dollars is over and above whatever we would have to cover on TAP. Um, and over so and above what I, would, I yeah. see. Right. Okay. Specifically for textbook things. In the I see. Well, then, then for every dollar over in tuition that goes up, what right. portion of it is going to have to go to cover the people who qualify for full tap? At the senior college, it, this doesn't affect the community colleges because community college tuition is still well below $5,000. But at the senior colleges, um, our tuition increase um, that we're including the credits is $41 million. Um, the revenue actually generates about $51 million. So about $10 million would have to be set aside um, to cover that gap between $5,000 and the new rate we're going to be at $5,430. And I assume that percentage would then stay constant as the tuition goes up unless the TAP increases. Correct. Okay. Correct. And with regard to that, uh, when, we, when we do the uh, uh, revenue targets, is that going to be on – the tuition increase or the tuition increase net of the uh, TAP uh, Net payment. of the TAP. And that's, that's the way we handled it this year as well. You, I mean, you knew that was going to be a question, right? Uh, <laughs> now, uh, with regard to the issue of the compact and the restructuring of the $10 million, the $10 million restructuring, uh -huh. uh, we're all on record of being extremely supportive of, of the compact and the shared uh, uh, contributions each each stakeholder should make, uh, but I do wonder in in a series of years where we suffered budget reductions, budget reductions often amount to de facto restructurings. You add the budget reductions on top of the sum now of all the restructurings we've taken. Uh, that 300 million goes north of 400 million, and I wonder at, at what stage of the of, of the process does it become difficult to actually achieve those kinds of restructurings? Mm -hmm. No, I, I, it's a it's a fair question, um, and our campuses um, since fiscal 2007, when we started the compact, have done a really uh, terrific job about. Um, finding efficiencies in their budgets, and, and you're right, the having to achieve cuts um, is a de facto way of, of, re of achieving efficiencies. Um, however, you know, we're still challenging ourselves and we're challenging our campuses to find other ways of being more efficient. We have a productivity committee um, that's been meeting for the last several months um, that has representatives of, of the campuses on there. Um, and since we've implemented the compact, we have given the campuses flexibility that um, if they want to, um, you know, bring down their efficiencies and do more in private fundraising and do more from enrollment growth, um, that we would have that conversation with them. Now, by saying that, we're not giving the campus, we're not letting the campuses off the hook by saying you can't do any productivity and efficiencies because we always feel that there's ways for them to find productivity and efficiencies. But we do allow them that flexibility to take the different components of their plan and increase or, or Again, decrease. Again, productivity them. can't be a service plan. Got to be speaking to services at least at the same level. Um, we've had bigger targets than that. I think it's it's across the whole university. I think it's a common. No, I, I understand. I'm just reminding people that there's two things going on here: the the things that we willingly take on, and then the things imposed upon us by outside sources. I mean, three hundred million dollars is still a significant amount of 
Bonnie. And the restructuring is not just uh, finding ways to operate the university more efficiently and then free up, well, monetize that exercise and then deploy those resources elsewhere. Restructuring in our way of doing things is looking for ways to generate revenue outside of the normal processes. And Alan and a group of people here in the administration and faculty uh, around the university as well, especially in our areas of technology and science, um, are, are very near a point where we're going to see some very real revenue generated from those activities, and that's going to be funneled into the operating budget as well. So it's not just extracting stuff and redeploying it, it's actually finding new sources of work that the university <coughs> could do and do well and generate the kind of revenue that we will need to, to fill some gaps. I'll give you kind of a simple example. We never licensed the products the university has, t-shirts, hats. We now have a firm that's marketing that for be, to begin with several hundred thousand dollars at the minimum, ultimately even a few million. We'll have tens of things we'll be doing with that. And your textbook initiative that uh, you're doing with IBM. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a whole slew of activities that are going on. Thank you. Um, I, a couple of points and then a, a question. Um, I think it is still the case, Matt, even though I have been going on the basis of, of what's in the record about giving to CUNY rather than your larger estimate, I think it's still the case that no university <coughs> fundraising has increased as much as a percentage as CUNY uh, has over those years. Now it's hard to increase your increases while your base is growing rapidly, but we do have an advantage if, if the maintenance of effort uh, provision is respected. We have the advantage that we're no longer asking people to put water into a leaking cup, and that is uh, a major advantage in talking to donors. Uh, my question is, is just uh, I don't understand how the point works about tuition credit uh, for students eligible for TAP if the tuition exceeds 5000 mm -hmm. page 5. Yep. So if a student is receiving maximum Pell, Mm -hmm. Does that mean the amount of that student's tuition, if they are eligible for TAP, and our tuition exceeds five thousand, does that mean the amount that that student pays is five thousand, or is it zero? No, it's it's zero. If a, if a student zero. has a has a full TAP award of five thousand um, dollars, and our tuition currently in the fall semester for a resident senior college student is five thousand one hundred and thirty. So TAP will cover 5,000 of that 530. Uh, the university picks up the remaining $130. In addition, it also works for <coughs> students who receive part-time awards. Um, if, if a student receives a partial TAP award of, let's say, $2,500, the university has to pick up 50% of the gap of that 130 <coughs> so we would have to pick up $65 in that instance. Um, so the TAP award is still at $5,000. The entire $5,000 is picked up for the student. That additional piece above the $5,000 is picked up by the university. So, the so there's no impact on a student who has a full TAP award. And I don't think, uh, <coughs> Benno, that there's going to be a, uh, a reformation uh, in, in TAP this year. But um, I think the discussion is going to be very serious uh, starting for next year. But I, I don't really right. see right. Uh, changes. I mean, I'd like to be surprised, but I don't really see changes this uh, this coming fiscal year, 2012 to 2013, of changes in TAP. And that's unfortunate, but that's going to be very high on our uh, legislative agenda. May I ask a related question? Sure. Mm -hmm. um, do you happen to know, Matthew, what the percentage increase in TAP has been on an annual basis 
over the last few years? It's been it's been zero. It's been, it's been zero. five thousand over the last, no, last several years. I don't know, four or five years at least. At least. Yep. Okay. Yes. Is it true that the federal government, government is trying to decrease its fines a little? There is talk about uh, reducing Pell. We, uh, we started very early in, in, uh, with our uh, Congressional Caucus uh, to try to uh, turn that around uh, and mobilized a lot of other universities to work with us. And we were successful in the short run to get it uh, secured. Uh, I can't tell you with any certainty of whether that's going to be the case on a going forward basis when when the uh, federal government enacts uh, its uh, new budget. Uh, we'll see. It's pretty unlikely in an election year. That is true. But the federal government is under tremendous stress, obviously, uh, with all of the um, the deficits that are that are being encountered. So I, I don't know how this is going to play out. But uh, this one of the things uh, from our team, uh, are we taking an initiative to lobby the federal government not to cut fines a little? Yes. 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 Very much so. And and we were successful. When I say we, the university communities around the United States were very successful. But it. Uh, it's going to have to be, we're going to have to be vigilant on a going forward basis. A, a clarification, Pell, Pell money cannot be used for the increment between. Right. The legislation and states that, the, that <coughs> Pell cannot be used that's what, to that's fund the increment. That's what I thought. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Any further questions, comments? Call the question. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Chair Loda, be, before we leave this topic, I just want to, if I may, uh, just acknowledge uh, our Deputy Budget Director, Kathy Abada, and all the staff in the University Budget Office for their terrific work in putting their request together for this year. Thank you. Thank you all. You're here. You're here. Okay. Next item of business um, is a resolution to authorize the City University of New York to adopt the revised schedule of tuition charges for students in the doctoral of physical therapy program at the Graduate Center within City University effective for the spring 2012 semester. Um, we all received uh, via electronically and also on the table here what the current rates are and what the um, effective rates will be. Um, I have a, uh, I'll put forward the motion. Is there a second? So moved. Okay. Questions? For Any? Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Next okay. motion. One, uh, yes, I'm one sorry. I apologize. One negative oh. vote. No. Sorry. Okay. Stay. Thank you. Sorry. <coughs> item E is a, uh, excuse me, item D is a resolution authorizes the City University of New York to adopt a revised schedule of tuition charges for students in the Doctorate of Nursing Science program <coughs> within the Graduate Center of CUNY, effective for the spring 2012 uh, semester. As with the prior motion, uh, we, we received the materials last week, and they're also in front of you at the table with the current full-time resident rates and the uh, current rates now and what they'll be going forward in the future. Um, I'll move the motion. Is there a second? Second. All in, uh, any questions, comments? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Opposed. Motion. And motion carries. Um, item E is a resolution authorizing the City University to adopt a revised schedule of tuition charges in the form of a tuition, tuition differential for the Doctor of Audiology Consortium Program, or the AUD, effective for the spring 2012 semester. Uh, as, as with the prior uh, resolutions, the uh, material was sent to us last week showing the current rates and the effective rates for this spring, as well as in front of us. I'll move the motion. Any second? Second. Questions? Comments? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? One opposed. Uh, motion carries. Um, item F is a resolution authorized the Board of <coughs> Trustees of the City University of New York to implement a rational tuition policy 
by increasing its tuition $300 annually for five years through fiscal year 2015 through 2016 for full-time undergraduate resident students and a proportional increase in graduate, doctoral, non-resident, and per credit rates at both the senior uh, colleges and the community colleges. Uh, as with all the prior motions, uh, the information was given to us last week and the detail is in, us, in front of us. I'll move the motion. I'll second. Second. Seconded. Uh, any questions, comments? Um, uh, thank you, Trustee. Uh, so I'm part of student government. Uh, we did a lot of survey and students, they don't want to pay extra money because in this bad economic situation, everybody is struggling. They don't have, most of the students, they are working class. Like, I'm from Lagori Community College and mm -hmm. most of the students, they are, they, they're really struggling. They cannot provide their, I mean, they cannot, they don't have job, they don't have money, they, they don't know how to pay their rents. Now, if we increase, if, if we continue increasing money, institution fee, that will be really tough to continue their study. And from CUNY, we said, uh, we, we want to uh, accelerate the graduation rate. Uh, I don't know how we're going to accelerate graduation rate if we increase the institution fee. Then they have to work more and come to school late. Like they have to drop some semesters, which will delay their graduation rate. <coughs> so I would leave up to the trustee to reconsider it before we vote on it. Any comments? Any questions? Thank you. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Thank you. And finally, is a resolution to authorize the Board of Trustees of the University to approve an amendment to the university's investment policy, uh, which uh, was uh, discussed last week at the investment subcommittee meeting, where we're permitting the senior vice, Pres senior vice chancellor of budget and finance and fiscal policy to delegate authority to the associate vice chancellor for uh, budget finance, as well as the university controller with decisions regarding expenditures in spending within the non-endowed funds. Uh, I'll, I chaired that meeting. I'll move the motion. Um, Second. Seconded. All in, any questions, comments? All in favor, say aye. 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 Motion, motion carries. Anyone voted yes? Now, finally, we have a report from the Chief Investment Officer. Excuse Ken. me. Uh, before, th was, was there supposed to be a, a report? Is, is, the, is the motion that we approved on the tuition and financial aid schedule 212 215, it, was that the uh, report that we had to present, the CUNY had to present to Albany, or is that another document? No, the, the Board of Trustees by November 30th, it's per the recent state legislation from this past June, has to submit a five-year uh, tuition plan um, to the State Assembly, State Senate, um, to the State Budget Director. Um, and so that resolution will be, if passed by the full board on November 28th, will be submitted to, to those, uh, to those partners. So this is the plan. That's all. I'm, mm -hmm. Thank you. Correct. I just wanted that to. That is the plan. Correct. Thank you. And just for one clarification, that when, when and if we pass it um, in the November meeting, do we have to revisit it every year, or is it automatic thereafter? You have to. We will always bring a budget request to the board, and embedded into that budget request will be a change in tuition. But there won't be necessarily a separate vote, as we're doing tonight, to disaggregate the tuition increase from the, uh, from the budget request. Thank you. Right. We'll move on now to the, um, in our chief investment advisor. Established uh, an endowment council to support our foundations um, in terms of meeting uh, investment and regulatory uh, challenges, uh, particularly in light of the uh, New York Prudent Investment Management Act. And uh, we had our first meeting where we had a comprehensive review of best practices in endowment management that was given by Cambridge Associates. Uh, we provided some updates on NIPMIFA. 
um, the feedback that we're getting is, is very good, and we have another meeting scheduled for November the 16th. Um, if anybody has any questions. Are, are these uh, legal bills going to be annually uh, incurred by us, or is this a once in a while kind of a of a thing with the, with the lawyers reviewing under the new we we did uh, because of the the act was passed uh, in September 2010 and given its various provisions we did seek um, outside counsel um, on the law in terms of the implementation uh, a large part of that has been completed um, and there, there might be some fine-tuning types of questions in terms of implementation going forward, but nothing along the lines of the massive work that was done to basically uh, become in compliance with the law. I, I see. Right. Was but that it, the it's Skadden? A one, yes. 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 Okay. That yes. was a one-time and yeah. minimal mm -hmm. error, not an annuity. But, but it's fair to say with the enhanced responsibilities that the investment committee is taken on, we're going to be looking for we'll outside help more from time to time. Yeah. We will be looking for outside help and meeting more frequently. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Any other questions? Okay, then I will, because um, we had a robust discussion on performance a week ago, I will simply hit the, the high points. Um, first, some good news. Uh, since last week, we received uh, an estimated return for October, which was up 8.2% for the pool, uh, basically reversing the, um, the negative returns that <laughs> we had reported a week ago um, and bringing us on a calendar year-to-date basis up about 1.5% uh, and our market value being at $161 million. So what a difference a week can make. <laughs> Um, Are you including today in those numbers? <laughs> no, but that's right. Friday. <laughs> that would be a week and a day. Uh, uh, yeah, volatility is uh, an interesting thing. <laughs> right. um, but as you know, the, the theme in, in, in the markets for some time has been uh, the, the macro-driven <laughs> environment um, and massive swings in investment sentiment due to the whole deleveraging process that we're going through. Uh, due to uncertainty with regard to central bank action and uncertainty with regard to um, uh, po politics everywhere. <laughs> um, so what this has led to is uh, increasing correlations, um, as, as uh, Trustee Martel pointed out last week. And what this does is that certainly companies are, are moving more in unison with the sentiment. Um, having said that, we don't expect this to last forever, um, and uh, we feel fortunate in that uh, you know we can basically stay the course with our strategic plan because our liabilities are so low and fixed with regard to the pool. It's basically the the spending rate, um, and we can use the situation to to leverage the pool in terms of. Uh, gradually <laughs> rebalancing to target and looking for capable managers who can who can add value by not only uh, benefiting from uh, the increasing correlations but also those who are capable of, of uh, seizing the benefits in terms of disparities in valuation on companies and and um, and, and segments of the market so um, while everything seems to be very uncertain and volatile um, we feel that we we have a pretty uh, good disciplined um, strategy um, that we are constantly looking to fine tuning and improve. Okay. There was a congressional hearing two weeks ago on exchange traded funds, uh, in which the most distinguished witness said that the effect of these is, has been to turn our stock markets into a casino on steroids. <laughs> True. <laughs> <laughs> that and, and a lot of the program trading, I think that, you know, it's really, the, the markets have so changed um, over the years. Look how the bond market has <laughs> done in 
the last couple of decades relative to stocks. I mean, that's without precedent as well. Right. So with that, um, if there are any questions. Any questions, comments? Okay. Thank you, Janet. Uh, there being no further um, business for this meeting, I'll move for an adjournment. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Trick or treat. Yeah, I hope so too. I heard, just heard that, you know. <laughs>